Well, good morning again. Today is uh, Sponsorship Sunday, and we'll be telling you more about that in just a few moments. But our prayer today is that uh, we as a church will make a difference in the lives of scores of boys and girls in Haiti and in Africa and change their lives not only here on planet Earth, but change their lives for all of eternity. That's our hope and prayer, and uh, we'll be saying more about that in just a few moments. Uh, Take your Bibles, uh, your iPad, your iPhone, and turn with me to Exodus chapter 16. Exodus chapter 16. Today we're going to look at an exciting passage of Scripture. It's been exciting for me to study it uh, these past uh, seven days, and I trust and I believe that it'll be an encouragement and a blessing to you. So, uh, let me ask you a uh, question this morning. Can you trust God to meet your needs? All right? Kind of a simple question, right? So, simple question, maybe too simple. All of us know the answer that we're supposed to give to that, and our answer is yes, we can trust God to meet our needs. So, So let me ask you maybe a better question, a little bit more personal question. Do you trust God to meet your needs? Now, not can you, but but do you on a daily, on a weekly, on a monthly basis, do you trust God to meet your needs? One of the coolest things I promise you that you will ever experience in your life is to feel, sense, and see God provide for your needs. Several years ago, actually in 2013, we were going through a little bit of a difficult spell financially in the ministry. That happens sometimes, and uh, thankfully God continues to bless the ministry. But it was just about this time of year in 2013, and we were projecting to be about forty or fifty thousand dollars off of budget for our year that we were going to end in the red and our leadership team and our staff began to pray obviously nobody wants to end in the red that affects ministry that affects all of those things and we began praying that God would miraculously provide for that need the end of our fiscal year is June the end of June and we were coming up towards the end of our fiscal year and from a purely accounting point of view it didn't look good it looked like we were going to be in the red and one day Margaret Ryan, who is our business manager, comes in my office and hands me an envelope and says, Pastor Brian, you need to take a look at this. And generally, when someone comes in my office and hands me an envelope and says, I need to take a look at that, often it's not good news, it's bad news. And I'm like, oh my word, so so what? We have a big bill, we have what? And she said, open it up. And so I, I opened it up, And inside was a check, we can put a picture of it up on the thing, was a check from an individual that I had met one time, does not live in South Florida, lives in Chicago, Illinois. I'd had a simple conversation about our ministry. He did know one of our sons, and God had felt led, or or God had led him and his wife to write us a check. Look at the amount there for $55,000. And so, we don't get a lot of checks for $55,000 at our church. And so, I had to look, and the first thing is, oh my word, I wonder if we put the comma in the wrong place, you know? And so, but, but needless to say, more than a month before, God had been working on he and his wife's heart And God used them to meet a huge need that we had in the ministry. And so just so you know, God used all of that in 2013. Guess what? We ended up in the black. We ended up in the black both on the church side and on the school side as well. That was a huge moment for us. God proved individually and ministerially that he had our back. That, that he would take care of us in ways that we could not even imagine. And that God had the ability to speak to someone's heart that's not even sitting in our congregation week after week, someone in a completely different part of the country, God could move their hearts to provide a need that we had. 
I'm sure some of you have experienced that in your life as well. If we had the time, we could take the microphone and go around the auditorium, and some of you could could detail and give testimony to some miraculous ways that God has provided for your needs. Some really cool stories, I'm sure, how God took care of you. But here's what I want us to see today. God's daily provision for us is just as miraculous as his unexpected provision for us. Does that make sense? Let me say that again. Are you awake this morning? I know it's just a little warm in the building. If you're a little warm, just lean over and blow in the person's ear beside you, all right? No, actually, if it's not your spouse, please don't do that, all right? God God is able to meet our needs, and God's daily provision in our lives is just as miraculous as His unexpected, unanticipated provision. Here's what I'm saying. What God does for you and me on a weekly basis is miraculous. And, and God desires for us to trust Him, not just in those momentous occasions when we desperately need Him, but God desires, to tr- God desires that we trust Him every single day of our lives. We see that in the passage of Scripture that we're studying today, Exodus chapter 16, and you'll see how how God desired for the Israelites to trust Him, and as they trusted Him, you'll see how God proved Himself faithful. So if you have your Bibles, we're in Exodus chapter 16. We're going to study the entire chapter today, and I promise you we're going to do it quickly because we want to end in a, in a powerful way this morning. But Exodus chapter 16, beginning in verse 1, follow along. If you don't have it in front of you, we'll put it up on the screen. Exodus 16 verse 1. And they set out from Elam. Remember, we're talking about the children of Israel who had been in the desert of Elam for a period of time. And so now they begin walking across the Sinai Peninsula, heading towards the promised land. They set out from Elam, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of sin. Let me just pause for a second because we see the word sin and red flags come up. And we think, oh my word, they're going to be going through this wilderness of sin. As far as I know, the name of the wilderness of sin has nothing to do with sin in the children of Israel's lives. And so I don't want us to allegorize and so my word they were going to be walking through the wilderness of sin for 40 years, all right? That was the name of it, the wilderness of sin. And so they came to the wilderness of sin, which is between Elam and Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is where they would meet with God and they would receive the Ten Commandments. And so as they, as they journeyed towards Mount Sinai, they walked through the wilderness of sin. And after they had departed from the land of Egypt, verse 2, and the whole congregation of the people of Israel, what's the next word? Grumbled against Moses. Any of you ever grumbled before? Any of you ever complained before? The children of Israel grumbled against Moses and against Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said, would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. Moses, why have you brought us out here in the wilderness to kill us, to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Let's pause there, have a word of prayer, and we'll dig into the passage. Father, I pray that you'd help us not just to see the children of Israel in this passage, but help us to see ourselves in this passage. It's easy for us to condemn them for being ungrateful and unthankful, and Lord, I'm fearful that we do the exact same thing, that you provide us, that you provide for us in ways that we cannot even begin to fully understand And yet, Lord, like them, we grumble. Help us to see that that you were fully able to provide for the nation of Israel, and you were fully able to provide for us. Lord, all you want us to do is to trust you. And as we trust you, you prove yourself faithful, and you prove yourself strong. Speak to us. Lord, make us willing to even take steps of faith in our lives 
that demonstrate our trust in you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So just a couple of uh, background um, facts so, so we understand what's taking place. It had now been one month since the Israelites had left Egypt. In the past 30 days, they had seen God do four amazing things. You remember, we studied them. First of all, God brought the 10th plague. And by the way, all 10 of the plagues were amazing. But in the last 30 days, they had experienced that 10th plague in which God had came and, and God had killed the firstborn of all the Egyptians. And as a result, Pharaoh said, get out of here, leave. And he released the Israelites. They had experienced that. In the last 30 days, they had seen God part the waters of the Red Sea. Remember, they were were escaping, and, and Pharaoh changed his mind, and Pharaoh was on their tail, and so Pharaoh's behind them. The Red Sea is in front of them, and they had no idea how they were going to survive when God miraculously parts the waters of the Red Sea, and they walk across that sea on dry land. They had seen that. And then as they walked across the sea on dry land and they looked back and and they saw the Egyptians pursuing them, they saw God bring the waters back to their normal level and kill all of the Egyptians. And the text says, you'll remember, that they saw the dead Egyptian soldiers' bodies on the shore. They'd experienced God doing the miraculous. And then, just a few days later, as they came to Elim and they tried to drink water, the water was bitter, and they cried out to the Lord and grumbled against the Lord, and the Lord made the bitter water sweet. Four times in 30 days, God demonstrated His power in their midst. Now, you would have thought, and I thought, that after experiencing four ginormous miracles, I'm not sure whether that's a word or not, but after experiencing four ginormous miracles in just four weeks, that the faith of the Israelites would be rock solid. That there would be nothing that would move them, there would be nothing that would cause them to doubt. To the contrary, they would be completely dependent and believing in God. As you see in the passage though, that was not the case. After leaving the oasis of Elim, they travel into the desert, and they quickly begin to grumble, and they quickly begin to complain. Here's the first thing that I wrote in my notes that you have today. The first thing is this. It is easier to complain than it is to have faith. Is that true? It's easier to complain than it is to have faith. That's what the Israelites do in this passage. Verse 3, they begin to uh, complain and to grumble. And here's what they say. Remember, try to remember what's taking place. They say, oh, Egypt was so much better than this. At least in Egypt, we had meat while we sat by the fire, and we had meat to the full, and we had bread. We had everything we wanted in Egypt. Oh, Those were the good old days when we were in Egypt. Now, as as I tell the story and as you read through it, like me, you're probably thinking, wait a second, (laughs) wasn't it just a few months ago that they were crying out to God? And they were saying, God, get us out of here. God, rescue us. Isn't that what they were doing just a few uh, months ago? And you're exactly right. In Egypt, they were overworked. In Egypt, they were abused. In Egypt, they were even tortured. And yet now, for some reason, they look back on their time in Egypt with a selective memory. And they can't remember the bad things that were taking place. They just remember the good old days in Egypt. So I was thinking about that. I thought, what? is up with the Israelites. How in the world could they have responded that way? Why, they were forgetful. They were ungrateful. They were faithless. Now, pause with me for just a second. And before we are quick to judge the Israelites, we need to realize that like the Israelites, you and I often forget what God has done in our lives. Am I right? 
we often take for granted the blessings of God. God's goodness, God's grace becomes so commonplace in our lives that we frequently take it for granted. Let me, let me explain what I mean. Guys, married guys today, you have a wife that loves you. That is a demonstration of grace. You say, Brian, what are you talking about? L- listen, she loves you in spite of the fact that you throw your socks on the floor. She loves you in spite of the fact that, that you leave the toilet seat up when you get done. I think I'm allowed to mention the word toilet in church, aren't I? You leave the toilet seat up. Uh, she loves you in spite of your quirks, in spite of your, listen, that is a demonstration of the grace of God in your life. God's given us healthy children. God's given us healthy grandchildren. You have a job. You have a nice home. Many of you have two cars in the driveway. You have a closet full of clothes and at least the beginnings of a 401k. You have years of good health in your life. And then all of a sudden, we experience a difficulty. We experience a trial. We experience a financial pressure, pressure in our life. And what do we begin to do? We begin to grumble. We begin to complain. How could my boss just let me go like that? How could my friend treat me that way? How could my doctor misdiagnose me? And now I'm facing all of these problems. At that moment, even though God has an extensive track record of being good to us, at that moment, we feel like we have the right to complain. Do we not? And we complain and we grumble. Here's what I want you to catch, and we see it in the passage. Whenever we complain, even though we're complaining against a boss, or even though we're complaining against a doctor, or even though we're complaining against a friend or a loved one, we need to realize that in reality, our complaints are against God. They're not against that person. Our complaints, our grumbling is against God and what God is doing in our lives. Let me... Let me show you that from the passage. Notice verse 6 as we continue reading. Verse 6, so Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, at evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. By the way, if you have a pencil and you have an old-fashioned Bible, it'd be good just to circle how many times you see the word grumble in all of this. All right, for he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For who are we or what are we that you grumble against us? And Moses said, when the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling that you grumble against him. What are we? Notice this phrase. Your grumbling is not against us. Read the rest of the verse with me. But against the Lord. Here, here's what Moses is telling the children of Israel. Whenever something happens in your life that you don't like and you complain, your grumbling is not about your situation. Your grumbling is not about your job. Your grumbling is not about your spouse. Your grumbling is not about your financial complaint, a, a planner. You are complaining. You are grumbling against the Lord and what he has done in your life. Even though we would never dare to accuse God of unfaithfulness, in reality, that's what we are doing because we sit back and we question the very sovereignty of God in our lives. Notice how Moses describes it in the chapter over and over again. He says that they were were grumbling, and then he says, your grumbling is not against me. Your grumbling is not against Aaron but you are grumbling against no one else but the Lord. Here's what I wrote in my notes. Wow. What a a powerful statement. 
Whenever I complain, and I can complain with the best of them, all right? I can grumble with the best of them. But I need to realize that when I do that, I'm not grumbling against any other person or any other situation. In, uh, I am literally complaining against what God is allowing to take place and to transpire in my life. Notice the words of Paul in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 14. Paul says this, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Now, I'm not the smartest person that's ever lived, but I do know that the phrase all things means what? All things. He doesn't say, don't grumble about most things. Or or every once in a while, you're going to have a right to grumble and complain. No, he says what? Do all things without grumbling or disputing or complaining or bickering or causing a problem. Why is that? Because God allows those things to transpire in our life. Because at the end of the day, catch this church, at the end of the day, God is more concerned about whether we are being molded and shaped into his image than he is about how much money we have in the bank accounts or whether we're on track for retirement, or whether our kids are in the best school, or whether we're living in the house that we want to live in for the rest of our life. God, the most thing that God is concerned for you and for me is that we be molded and shaped into his image. And so we need to sit back and realize that God even allows the difficult things that happen in our life to test us and to prove us and to grow us and to sanctify us. We see that here in the passage of Scripture. That's exactly what he's doing in the life of the Israelites. Let me show you a second truth from the passage. The second truth is this. God has promised to provide our daily bread. Let me read verses 4 and 5, because verse 4 and 5, we have the promise. Notice verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether they walk in my law or not. So notice what God says, and we'll see it in a moment. God says, I'm doing this for what purpose? To test you. I'm doing this to grow you. I'm doing this so that you might be more sanctified in my sight. Verse 5, on the sixth day when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. Verses 4 and 5 in the promise is the promise. Verses 13 through 17 is the fulfillment. I know we're racing through the chapter, but jump with me to verse 13. Because in the beginning of the chapter, God tells them what he's going to do. In verse 13, he does it. In the evening, quail came up and covered the camp. And in the morning, dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? We'll see that in just a moment. For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given to you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it, each of you, as much as he can eat. You shall take an omer, and omer is about two quarts or about seven pints. You shall take about seven pints according to the number of the persons that each of you has in his tent. And Israel did so. Some gathered more, some gathered less. So so God told them, I'm going to provide bread for you. And the next morning when they woke up, guess what there was? There was bread on the ground. They called it manna. The word manna literally means, you see it in the passage, the word manna literally means, what is it? (laughs) And so as they came out on that first morning and they saw that God had provided just as he promised he would, they looked at the provision and their first question was, what is this? That's what the term manna means. What is it? Later in the chapter, you can read later on that manna is described as small, little, white wafers that tasted as sweet as honey. It was like nothing that the Israelites had ever tasted before. 
Notice several things about God's provision of this manna that applied to them, and, and we'll see in just a moment that it applies to us. First of all, the manna that God gave them was supernatural. It was supernatural. Um, uh, uh. They, didn't have to, uh, the, they didn't have to do a lot of work for it. They didn't have to go to the store and buy it. It's not like they went down to the supermarket and said, man, give me a, give me a French baguette. Give me an Italian ciabatta. Give me a, a Cuban loaf of bread. I want a Cinnabon. No, God gave it to them. Each and every day, their bread was received from heaven. Could you imagine every day the food that you eat coming from nowhere else but heaven itself? Notice verse 4 once again. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I'm about to rain bread from where? From heaven for you. The manna that God gave them was supernatural. Notice the second thing as we race through this. The manna was sufficient for them. Verse 4 says, the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day. So here's what he said. Every day you're going to wake up and there's going to be this dew over the land. Every single day I'm going to provide for you exactly what you need. Let me pause there for a second and say this. Like the Israelites, you and I need to realize that God will give us exactly what we need each and every day. God will give you exactly what you need today. It's interesting that God never promises to meet tomorrow's needs today. We, we, we live in a culture that likes to stockpile, do we not? I mean, we go to Costco and we buy in bulk because we just don't want the little box of cereal. We want the big box of cereal, right? We want to make sure that we have enough. Or you just don't want the little jar of peanuts. You want the huge jar of peanuts. You don't want just enough today. You want enough for today, for tomorrow, and next week. And yet we see in Scripture that God never promises to meet tomorrow's needs. God's provision is promised one day at a time. Remember the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 11? We're told to pray, give us this day our daily bread. And so the next day we pray what? Give us this day our daily bread. That's what God did. Day after day after day after day for 40 years. He provided for the Israelites exactly what they needed. Day after day, year after year, decade after decade, God gave them enough bread. As a matter of fact, if you look later in the chapter at verse 35, it says this, the people of Israel ate the manna 40 years till they came to the border of Canaan. I thought, let's do the math. Let's just do the math, how much God provided for them. And so I kind of put this mathematical equation up there. Seven pints, which is how much they gathered per person per day, times three million people, which, which they estimate between two and a half to three million people, times 365 days per year, times 40 years, how much bread is that? One huge miracle. By the way, I didn't do that math. Russell Johnson, one of our pastor's friends, did that math and did the equation, so I was just able to steal from him. Listen, if you could sit back and count how much God has provided for you in the last year, in the last five years, in the last 10 years, in the last 30 years, in the last 40 years, you know what that would be in your life? It would be one huge miracle. But because we don't see it in bulk, we tend to what? We tend to take it for granted. What if God came down today and said, Brian, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you today everything you need for the rest of your life. And God said, hey, go buy a bigger house. Go buy some barns. Go rent a warehouse. I'm going to give you everything you need for the rest of your life. Boy, it would be huge, I'm sure, what God has for us. And it would be for you as well. But he doesn't do that. Why is that? Because he wants us to trust in him. And so he gives us 
each and every day our daily bread. Notice it's really interesting that they were commanded not to hoard the stuff. They were commanded not to stockpile the stuff. Somebody could have sat back and thought, man, the, this bread tastes like Krispy Kreme donuts. These are fantastic. I want to make sure and have these every single morning. So instead of seven pints, I'm going to get 14 pints, and I'm going to stockpile a little bit away every day. Could they do that? No, because the next day it what? It spoiled. It turned to worms. God literally told them, don't hoard what I'm giving you. Because when you hoard what I'm giving you, it's a demonstration of a lack of faith. Trust me each and every day. So here's what I wrote in my notes. Hoarding God's supply is unproductive and senseless. Now listen, I'm not telling you to don't put money away for a rainy day. I'm not telling you today to go out and cash your 401k and, and give it all the church because God's going to take care of you. I'm not saying that, but, but let's be honest. We often have way more than we need. And the poorest of, of us here today is incredibly wealthy according to the world's standards. So what we do is we continue to raise our level of financial expectation. We continue to raise what we think are our needs. Let me give you an example. Remember how much you used to pay for a cell phone? I mean, we used to pay, what, $30 a month for a cell phone. And now, my cell phone bill is almost as much as my house payments. I'm exaggerating a little bit. I'm exaggerating a little bit. It, don't come up to me afterward and offer me your plan. I'm exaggerating, all right? I'm exaggerating. But what I'm saying is simply this. Rather than realizing, boy, God continues to bless and God continues to bless, we just keep getting better and more expensive gadgets and our financial needs continue to increase over and over and over again and we fail to realize why God is blessing us. I'm getting ahead of myself. God did not bless us so that we can bankroll, so that we can stockpile his provision. Rather, he blesses us so that we can use his provision for the kingdom of God. Now, notice quickly, the manna was sacred. It not only was supernatural, it not only was sufficient, but it was sacred. Verse 32 says this, Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded, let an omer of it, seven pints be kept throughout your generations so that they may see the bread with which I fed you out of the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. God said, listen, guard just one omer of that bread. And here's what I want to have you do. I'm going to have you put it in the Ark of the Covenant alongside of the testimony, which are the Ten Commandments that they would receive later later on, and I want you to put it in the Ark of the Covenant so that you might always remember the fact that I have promised to meet your needs. Kind of like the picture of this check. I keep this check really handy. Because whenever I sit back and begin to doubt, oh my Lord, how are we going to do this? Or God, how are you going to do this? I pull this check out on a frequent basis. It's a reminder to me that God has our back. It's a reminder to me that God will meet our needs. Let me show you a fourth thing in the passage. The manna was not only supernatural, it was not only sufficient, it was not only sacred, but the manna was sanctifying. You see, the daily collection of the manna was part of their spiritual growth. The daily collection of the manna was a way in which their faith Increase. Let me show you some verses. We're going to bounce through. Notice verse 4 of this chapter. We saw it just a few moments ago. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I'm about to send rain from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day. Now, you, like me, might have sat back and said, Okay, Lord, let me help you out on this. All right? We can help you. It'd be a whole lot better if you'd give us a month's portion at a time. Or it'd be a whole lot easier for you if you'd give us a year's portion at a time. But God said, no, there's a reason why I'm giving it to you every single day. Notice, every day you shall go out and gather a day's portion, every day, what's the next phrase? That I may test them. 
to see whether they will walk in my law or not. God said, I'm only going to give you what you need today. Why? Because tomorrow is going to be an exercise of faith. And the day after that is going to be an exercise of faith. And the day after that is going to be an exercise of faith. And every day you are going to be reminded that you need me. You cannot live by bread alone. You you desperately need me. So notice verse 22. Here's what they were encouraged to do. Verse 22. On the sixth day, though, they went out every day. First day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day. On the sixth day, they went out and gathered twice as much. And so instead of gathering one omer or seven pints, they were to gather individually two omers of four or, or 14 pints. And when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, this is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil, and all that is left over lay aside to be kept till morning. Now here's another miracle, because if they would have done that on Monday, what would have happened the next morning? it would have spoiled. If they would have done it on Tuesday, the next morning it would have spoiled. But on the sixth day, every single sixth day, they took twice the amount. They baked twice the amount, and they woke up. What? It was good. And God provided for their needs. Verse 23, tomorrow was a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Verse 24, so they laid it aside till the morning as Moses commanded them, and it did not stink nor did it have worms in it. Listen, here's what I wrote in your notes, and I want you to catch this. Every week, the Israelites collected manna for six days and rested on the Sabbath day, trusting God to provide the food that they needed. Now, what if they went out out on the sixth day and said, you know what, I'm just going to get enough for today. That's all I'm going to get, just enough for today. And they didn't trust God. And they came out, which some of them did. They came out on the seventh day to gather food. And guess what? There was no food. And, And God chided them, where is your faith? Why don't you listen to me? You see, every seventh day was a demonstration of their faith. They trusted God. And they rested in him. Catch this. This might be the most important thing that I say in the message today. Likewise, your faith is activated when you rest in God's ability to multiply your efforts and to provide for your needs. Let me say that again. Your faith is activated whenever you rest in God's ability to multiply your efforts and to supply your needs. We don't have the time to talk about it today. We're going to talk about it one day because rest is such an important principle in Scripture. Rest is God's plan for our lives. You might say, you might say, that's what I'm talking about, Brian. Tell my wife that when I go home and take a nap this afternoon for two hours. All right, that's not the kind of rest that he's talking about in the passage, even though I want you to take a a nap this afternoon. That's not what he's talking about. To rest does not convey the idea of taking a nap, but rather of ceasing from our labors and trusting in God. You see, we work five or six days and we rest, trusting God to multiply our efforts. We, by faith, give to God's work. Who can afford to do it on a regular basis? But we, by faith, do that week after week, giving to God's kingdom work by faith. And we rest, trusting God to meet our needs. By the way, that's where a lot of people have never gone because they want to sit back and they want everything to mathematically equate to everything to come out, and it doesn't always come out. Why? Because it is a life of faith. And, and resting is sitting back saying, God, I'm not going to worry about this. I'm not going to fret about this. I am going to trust you. I'm going to rest in you. I've done the best I can, but I'm going to rest in you and trust in you. We teach God's word and minister to our community and rest, trusting that he will build his church. It's his work. How about you today? Have you learned to trust 
in Him? Have you learned to rest in Him? Let me challenge you today. Test Him. Try Him. Prove Him. Rest in Him and allow Him to prove Himself faithful. The Israelites did. And for 40 years, God met their needs. And I promise you today, I promise you, that just as God met the needs of the Israelites, his people, he desires to meet your needs as well. That doesn't mean he's not going to test us. That doesn't mean he's going to try our faith. But as we trust him, God has promised to come through and to meet our needs, not our wants, our needs as we trust him. Let me give you two important takeaways that I want to end in a, in a special way today. Two important takeaways that I want you to catch. The first is this. The manna in Exodus chapter 16 and throughout the Pentateuch, whenever it's mentioned, the manna points us to Jesus Christ, the great provider of our material and spiritual needs. You see, even though he provided the manna for 40 years, the manna wasn't about the manna. The bread wasn't about the bread. It wasn't even about the Israelites eating to their full. The bread was about Jesus Christ, the bread who was to come. And it was a future, it was an illustration of the fact that God, through Jesus, will meet all of our needs physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Let me share with you the words of Jesus today. John chapter 6 and verse 51. Notice what Jesus says referring back to Exodus chapter 16. John 6 and verse 51, Jesus says this, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Here's what Jesus is saying. I am the manna, the manna that the Israelites ate in the Old Testament. That points to me, to no one else than me. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Verse 58 of John 6. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like the bread that our fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this, this bread will live forever. Here's what Jesus is saying. Although bread is filling, although bread is satisfying, it satisfies for a limited period of time. Wouldn't it be great if there was one donut that you could eat and you would never crave donuts again for the rest of your life? But that's not the case. You eat one, and what do you want? At least I do, another one. And if I eat another one, guess what I want? Another one. I'm a donut fanatic. I'll eat a dozen if you give them to me. One never satisfies. And they eventually what? Kill me, at least, all right? Eating that many, all right? But here's what Jesus says. I am the bread that always satisfies. And if you eat of me, you will never die. You will live forever. Just as the manna sustained the Israelites for 40 years, so Jesus Christ can strengthen and sustain us. Have you partaken of him today? What I mean by that is if you come to a place in your life where you realize that you desperately need him and he alone is the answer to your problems. He alone is the provision that you so desperately need. My challenge to all of us today is to turn by faith to Jesus Christ. He is the bread that comes down from heaven. Let me show you a second principle and then we're gonna do something different today. The second principle is this. God provides more than we need not for us to accumulate, but for us to distribute to others. Let me say that again. God provides more than we need, not so that we can accumulate, rather so we can distribute to others. Here's what I want you to catch today. We have been blessed for a reason. You have been blessed for a reason. God gives to us so that we in turn might give to others. 
We've been called to be distributors instead of hoarders. I'm gonna ask, I have a, a group of people from our congregation that I'm gonna ask to come up. Steve, if you'd come, and Dan, and we're glad to have Jade here from Sheltering Wings. Today is Sponsorship Sunday at Hollywood Community Church. You say, Brian, what is that all about? Well, here's what it's all about. We realize that there are boys and girls around the world who have greater needs than you and me. I shared that yesterday in our, in our community service, people who come for to, to get food. And I said, listen, every single one of you here today are wealthier than many of the kids around the world. And some of them kind of looked at me incredulously. What are you talking about? I said, listen, no, nobody's here today with shredded clothes. Nobody walked in here barefooted because you couldn't afford a pair of shoes. Nobody is here today with bloated stomach because you haven't been able to eat in recent days. God has blessed us more than we could ever imagine. We are the most blessed country on the face of the earth from a financial point of view. Why is that? Because we deserve it. Oh, do we? We're a nation that's turning our back on God quickly, more quickly than we can imagine. God has blessed us, you, me, for the purpose of being a blessing to others. And so today, we want to we wanna challenge you to, to take what God has given you and impact the life of a child. Impact the life of a child, not only for this life, but for all of eternity. Um, our panel today, Steve and uh, Felicia went with us uh, to Burkina Faso just uh, a month or so ago. Dan kind of uh, heads up, uh, not kind of, Dan heads up our, our Haiti ministry and coordinating our work in Haiti, our sponsorship, and Jade, we're glad to have Jade Beckman with us. Jade is on staff at Sheltering Wings, which is the mission organization of Amy, and uh, Jade uh, flew down just to be with us today, kind of heads up their finance and administration. So I kind of just want to ask them a couple of questions and you hear from them today. Because you hear from me all the time. Probably hear from me too much. But I want you to hear from them. And so I just kind of want to ask them a couple of questions because all of them believe in what we're talking about today. So, so Steve, let me first start with you. You and Felicia have, have supported a child and I believe a widow for a period of time. What first motivated you guys to get involved in sponsorship? Well, um, a number of years ago, Felicia and I were at a, a Christian concert and World Vision was doing a, a sponsorship drive there. And um, Felicia and I have six kids, so we figured, you know, why not one more? Um, so we, we sponsored a child through World Vision and for a couple of years, and eventually that child's family got to a financial point where they didn't need sponsorship anymore, which is great. So we sponsored another one, and a couple years later, same thing happened. And about that time is when Mike and Amy were um, heading to Africa. They had gone over there and been there for a while, and um, so we just we knew about sponsoring kids in Burkina, so we said, you know, why don't, why don't we do that as well? So that's how we ended up sponsoring them. Just so recently, uh, when we were over in Africa, you had the privilege of, uh, I think, meeting for the first time the child that you sponsor and also meeting the widow that you guys sponsor as well. Tell us about meeting that child and, and what was that like? How did, what did that do for you? Well, it, it was a, a really rewarding experience, a very humbling experience. Um, Justine, the little girl that we sponsor, um, uh, She's not an, an orphan. Her mother, um, um, she lives with her mother, but um, her mother can't afford to send Justine to school. In Burkina, they um, have public schools, but you have to pay to go. So if you can't afford, you don't get, get to go. So by sponsoring her, she gets to go to school, she gets a uniform, she gets fed while she's at school. And so we had the privilege of not only meeting her, but meeting her mother and her little sister. And it, it was, you know, through the interpreter, obviously, talking, it was very humbling from, you know, from, you know her mother you know, talking to us to see that, you know, something that she can't afford to do, that we're enabling um, Justine to go to school and help get an education, which, of course, with um, a poverty cycle, that's the best thing you can do is get a child educated. So that was, it was, it was pretty amazing. Another thing that was really fun was we, we brought Justine some gifts. We got a backpack, we filled it with some candy and school supplies and things that Amy told would be good to bring over there. And um, so we gave her those, and of course, she was very excited. And um, Felicia said, you know, if there's one other thing that we could, we could ever get you, you know, for your birthday or Christmas or whatever, you could have whatever you want, what would you like to have? She didn't say, you know, you know an iPad or an iPhone 7 or anything. She said, what I'd really like to have is a backpack. Wow. It's such a simple thing. And, and 
she didn't realize the backpack that was sitting there we brought for her. It was hers. And we just thought, you know, we'll bring a backpack, not ever knowing that's something that she really wanted. And she was so happy to have just that simple, simple thing. And like I said, that's the, the humbling part about it is um, we have so much here. And if you think, you know, what's $35 really going to do? How much is it really going to help somebody? It is, was amazing to see what, you know, what can be done with that and how gracious the people are that, that are receiving it. Amen. Hey, one more thing. I know we didn't plan on this, but they also got to meet their widow when we were there. And you and Felicia took her several gifts. Uh, um, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag, but, but the best was probably the mattress that you took her. Kind of tell that in a few yeah, seconds. I mean, tell that story. That was, that was pretty wild, too. I mean, to meet her, we, we knew that she had had, um, when we got our original sponsorship card, that um, she had some walking issues. Her legs were bad. Well, when we went to actually see her, she got to the point where she couldn't walk at all. So she just sits in a, a small, it's like a 10 by 10 hut, concrete floor. And the only thing she had in there was no furniture in there. There was just a, like a cloth mat that she slept on. A rug, like yeah, a rug. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we brought her a, um, a mattress and, you know, she was just crying. She had never had. How, how, old, how old was she, you remember? She, our widow was, is, I think she's about some in her mid 60s. Okay. We met another one though that was. slept on a mattress before. Yeah. In her life. In her life. And they bought her a mattress and she and was we able bought to her sleep. A, 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 and God brought her a, a solar lantern because when the lights go out there, the lights go out. I mean, it's just dark. You don't, there's no electricity or anything. Yeah, that's cool. Dan, you and Diane have been actively involved in, in supporting kids in Haiti for, for a number of years. How many, uh, how long have you been involved in supporting Haitian kids? Well, <clears throat> in uh, 2010, y'all remember that a massive earthquake hit Haiti. Uh, estimates of between 150 and 300,000 were killed that year in that one event. Uh, Diane and I, our first missions trip was in 1980. We went to Germany, we went to the Netherlands, we went to Kenya. Nothing could have prepared me for Haiti. Uh, within three months after the earthquake, our company was down there to try to help with the reconstruction efforts. And were, roads were not even cleared yet. Uh, we work for a lot of developers, as does Steve's company. And one of those developers said, why would you go to such a God-forsaken place? And I like to remind people that the writer of Hebrews said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, that you may know that the Lord is your helper. Mm. I believe that was a wake-up call to our country, to this church. It was mm. shortly after that that you reminded us that uh, while we supported RMI, they were praying for us every day the church and, there in Quran. we had not yeah. had a missions trip there for a number of years. So we organized that first trip in 2011. Uh, that's when I got to sponsor my first two kids, uh, Robert Rogier and Sophia Petit. Hmm. It's in 2011. Wow. And I'd just like to say this, and I think the congregation, uh, you know this, we have a pastor that supports missions, and we're blessed because of that. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, so, so, um, so, so how does supporting a child in Haiti change that person's life, change that little kid's life? Well, we've been supporting Robert and Safoni since 2011. They were both little kids then. Uh, in the sixth grade down there, as Steve and Jade will tell you about Burkina Faso, going to school is not a right there, it's a privilege. Hmm. And at the sixth grade, uh, kids have to take a test to go on to the seventh and eighth grades. And in 2014, when we were down and got a report after upon our second trip, you were with us on that trip, Pastor, uh, they reported to us that of the 55 kids in our school that took the test to go from the sixth grade to the seventh grade, all 55 passed. Amen. That's Th great. That, that's a difference. Then, and then in the eighth grade, if they make it from the 6th to the 8th to go to secondary school, they have to take another test. And if they don't pass that test, they don't go to school anymore. Hmm. And 25 of our kids took that test 
in the eighth grade and 23 passed. So that, that makes That's a excellent. big difference. That's excellent. By the way, just so you know, we support, we have, we have a sister church in Karai, Haiti, and they have a school, and the kids that we support in Haiti are tied into that school. That's the school that Dan is talking about. And so by, by sponsoring a kid there, you literally are changing that child's life. And, and if I could just add one other thing, Steve mentioned about the mattress. Uh, Anthony, Wilson, uh, Marie, Hinch, Bill Ford, those who have gone down with us have seen the impact it has on these kids. But something that just blew our mind is that when we went down this last time in 2016, we had bought seven goats uh, just, to give, just to give goats away because they said goats were the biggest thing they needed. And the school marm, leader, Sister Audette, who did not even have a home to live in, she lived with others, uh, was told to pick out kids that had excelled in school because they wanted to give them those goats. And for those kids that we sponsored, she didn't know who we had sponsored, but we got pictures of each one of us with our kids with the goat that she had picked them for their excellence in school. And you would have thought they had been given a brand new bicycle from trek or somewhere when they got those goats absolutely it was an exciting experience absolutely i don't know if you remember last year when we raised funds for the meals in haiti and then we bought pastor john claude the bike we bought the goats as well seven goats and so uh hey how excited would your kids be well maybe they would be excited if you said i'm bringing a goat home i don't know maybe they would be but uh, maybe not as excited as the kids in haiti jade uh we're so glad jade has come down from st louis she's a part of the shelter and wings organization so Jade, from an organizational point of view, how many kids in Burkina Faso need sponsored right now? So I would say there's definitely over 100 kids that need sponsored, and that number can only grow. We work with local pastors that are Burkina Bay that help us find the kids that are in need of the hope that sponsorship provides. And so there's always more kids that can be sponsored, but there's over 100 right now still. I know when we were there and we went in the school, Steve, remember when we went in the school and uh, you, you so saw all these kids in the school and so many more kids that they would love to be able to get in, but they're not able because once again, education is not free there. So, so sponsoring a child through sheltering wings, what does exactly that do? It not only gives them schooling, but what else? How is that child benefited? So by it gives them schooling and then it gives them a chance to have medical attention when they need it, which is commonly something their family cannot afford. Um, it gives them some food to be able to eat and have a meal every day at lunch, you know, at school or even at home. But even more importantly than that, it gives them the hope of Jesus. Amen. You know, they get to learn about a God who loves them and a God who's ready to rescue them from where they are and just help them and just gives them hope that, that they have the chance of a life. They have a chance of life with Christ. Amen, amen. So we're not only bettering their lives. Yeah, that's great. We're not only bettering their lives here, but, but we're but eternally, but, yeah. but granting them, or obviously we're not the ones that granting them, giving them an opportunity to, to know Jesus and, and have eternal life. So, so quickly, Jade, how does somebody, so we're out here, um, how does somebody support? They have to write a check today for $420 to support the child all year long, or how is that done? Absolutely not. No, yeah. you can pay a simple $35 a month. And for me, we recently started sponsoring two kids, and I gave up my my daily coffee runs <laughs> so that so that we can sponsor these kids. It's simple, it's $35 a month. And I think that um, with the great things we're blessed with here in the States, these kids can have that chance of hope and they can hear the name of Jesus, you know, proclaimed and they can, you know, have that hope that they can do something with their life. They don't have to be another kid that doesn't ever get a chance. And so um, you'll get a chance to be able to look at these sponsors, these children that are here on the altars and just to give them that hope. And it's a simple $35 a month, or you could pay the 420 for a year. Yeah, or 840 for two years. Or, yeah. yeah, yeah, you can do whatever you want. Listen, let's give them a hand. Thank you so much, Dan and Jade and, and Steve. Thank you for sharing your story. And we could talk about other people in our congregation that have done this. As a matter of fact, I don't know exactly what the number is. Dan and, and, and Jade might know the number, but, but many of you have already stepped up to the plate and done this. I'm not sure I can think of a better investment of the provision that God gives to you. 
I'm not the Holy Spirit of God today. So I have no idea what the Holy Spirit is telling you. I know four or five years ago, God encouraged Vicki and I to do it, and we sponsor a child in Burkina Faso. I was able to meet Daniel just a few months ago. It's amazing how, how Daniel's life in weird ways corresponds with our life. And, and Vicki and I sponsor a boy in Haiti as well. Um, all I know is this. I know that God desires to use us. He blesses us for the purpose of being a blessing to others. Here's what Jesus said in Matthew 10 and verse 42. Jesus said, and whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say of you, he will by no means lose his reward. So it might seem insignificant. And to some, $35 is a lot. I understand that. I understand that. But I do know that God has blessed us for the purpose of being a blessing to others. So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plead on behalf of these little ones today. Would you allow God to use you to change the life of a little one? Would you allow God to use you. You say, Brian, I'm not sure whether I can do it. Remember, rest in God. Trust God. Let God prove himself faithful on your behalf. And I, along with scores of other people, can tell you that God will provide the means to do that.